Welcome to our online service at Canning Garden Methodist Church. We are so glad that you could come and join us as we worship the Lord together, even though we are in our various homes. And as we pray together our corporate prayer and prepare our hearts to listen to the preaching of God's Word. Let us start by having the call to worship together. Let your hearts be open to the Lord today. Let go of all the things that bind you in pain and sorrow. Come, let us praise the God of love. Amen. Let us join our hearts together as we say the opening prayer in unison. Holy One, we bow our hearts before you this day. Strengthen us in our innermost being and dwell in our hearts through faith. May we be rooted and grounded in Christ, whose love is beyond all knowledge. Help us comprehend even the smallest part of the beautiful mystery of your grace. Grant that we may experience the fullness of your presence with us. Amen. Psalm 92 verse 1 says, It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name for this time. And as we gather, brothers and sisters, let us lift up our voices to praise our Lord.
Freedom, I am 
Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that we can praise you and know that you are here with us even though we are in our various houses. And at this time, we want to come before you to intercede for various needs and we know that you are listening to us. Father, we want to pray that you will hear our prayers. In Jesus' name. The first thing we want to pray for is for the world. Disastrous floods have wreaked havoc across Europe with deaths and thousands missing, while in China, the equivalent of a year's average rain was dumped in just three days. So therefore, we want to pray for comfort and help for all the stricken families that have lost loved ones and lost property. We want to pray for all efforts to repair and rebuild we want to pray that warning systems giving people sufficient time to react will be improved. And we want to pray that the global leaders will heed the repeated predictions of expert scientists about all these climate changes and that they will take tough steps to combat this. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. 
The next thing we want to pray for is for our own nation, Malaysia. As you all know, the number of cases of COVID has gone up dramatically. However, we also want to give thanks that uh, vaccinations are underway. Let us pray that our country will be able to navigate through this pandemic and that all the people who are in charge of our country will take the correct steps that they will have wisdom from you to know how to lead our country out of this pandemic. And we also want to pray for all the rakyat to adhere to the SOPs even more strictly with the spreading of the Delta variant. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. The next thing we also want to pray for for our nation is for the reconvening of parliament. We want to pray that the parliament will be able to carry on and that uh, um, democracy will be upheld and that um, uh, um, our country will be on the right path. Let us commit our country to the Lord. Next, we want to pray for our own church, Canning Garden Methodist Church. We want to pray for all our pastors, leaders, and all members of our congregation, which includes you and I, that we will not encounter or succumb to physical, emotional, or spiritual fatigue uh, due to this pandemic. We also want to pray that unity, love, and support will prevail among us. And Lord, we also want to pray that uh, all the programs that we are going to um, hold, the Freedom in Christ, Alpha and the uh, Purpose Driven Life will be well uh, subscribed and that the people will benefit from all these courses. Let us uphold uh, our church, let us uphold specifically anyone we know who is lonely, anyone who is sick, anyone who needs prayer, let us bring our friends and our relatives to the Lord by name. Thank you.
Yes, Lord, we want to pray for Canning Garden Methodist Church. We want to pray, Lord, that our church will be a place where we can uphold one another, that we can be a place where we intercede for one another and where we care for one another. We want to pray also that our church will be a shining beacon to be a witness for you, that we will be able to help those in need, help those who are sick, help those who are depressed, that the church will be able to meet the needs of all our members. We want to thank you for our wonderful church and we want to pray, Lord, that you will continue to use our church to be a witness for Christ in this part of Ipoh. Thank you, Lord, for CGMC. Let us unite together uh, in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray the offertory prayer together. Gracious Lord, you have lavished upon us the riches of your glory. As you have given to us out of your abundance, we return our offering to you with praise and thanksgiving. In the name of the Saviour, we pray. Amen. Uh, through Alpha, I have uh, learned a great deal because it's uh, from the very basic. I feel I, I, I need to start from the basic and this was the, the best way to do it uh, through Alpha. So I am very glad uh, I joined Alpha. Mm -hmm. I am glad that Mimi pushed me to, to join Alpha too. Good day everyone. Um, my name is Alan here. Uh, she had to talk about me about the Alpha. When a good friend of mine told me about Alpha, I was skeptical at first because I thought it was another boring Christian thing. But something told me to give it a try. Uh, I myself believe a uh, Christian from Form 1. Um, as time goes by, studies and work, I forgot about him. So that's why I want to give it a try. So when I st first started with Alpha, it felt very comfortable and very family. Uh, yeah. I got close to everyone and it's easy to understand. As the classes goes further on, it reminded me what I've missed. Peace, happiness and forgiveness. That's one of the class that really brought me into Jesus Christ. I cried and, I, and, and it opened my eyes. The break rooms, the one-to-one -one prayer really, really helped me a lot. Very understanding. And after my Alpha courses was over, I'm already starting to join a church and I plan to be baptized after the pandemic is over. I would like to thank all Alpha family. Hi everybody and welcome to What on Earth Am I Here For? I'm Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church and the author of the book, The Purpose Driven Life. Now we're going to begin this 40-day journey by looking at life's three most important questions. The question of existence, why am I alive? The question of significance, does my life matter? And the question of intention, what is my purpose? The only way to know your purpose is to ask your creator who made you, why did you make me, God? 
Proverbs 9 verse 10 says this, knowing God results in every other kind of understanding. It all starts with God and it is all sustained by God. Life is all about God. It's not about you. It's going to be a great journey. God bless you. Let us stand for the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise God, the Son and Holy Ghost. taken from the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of 
all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome back to our series in the Sermons in Ephesians chapter 3. We continue from where we left off. Come, let us go to God in prayer. Father God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be found to be acceptable in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What you pray about and what intensity with which you pray will reveal what is really important to you. The hymn says, prayer is the soul's sincere desire. And this is certainly true of Paul's second prayer in Ephesians, in which he pours out his heart and soul to God. He has been explaining both Christ's reconciling work resulting in a new humanity and his personal receiving and ministering of that revelation. Now, he turns from explanation to intercession. He prays that God's great plan of uniting the Jews and Gentiles will be experienced by the church. In this prayer, Paul demonstrates three aspects of prayer we all need to have in order to pray meaningfully. First, the motivation of his prayer, for who and to who he is praying. Second, the content of his prayer, that the new humanity will know God's love. And third, the confidence of his prayer, the limitless power of God will accomplish this. Now first, Paul's motivation in praying the Father and his family. Paul begins for this reason, resuming his thought where he left in verse 1. Now what reason is Paul thinking of? Well, it must be the reconciling work of Christ and his ministry of reconciling the Gentiles and the Jews. Paul prays for his ministry and the people he is ministering to. Because his ministry of reconciliation and the people he is called to reconcile are important to him, he is motivated to pray for them. Now, Paul's example of prayer is instructive for all preachers and teachers of God's Word. As preachers preach and as Bible study and cell group leaders teach the Word, we must be praying both for the ministry and the people we minister to. And all of us learners, learners of God's word are also called to pray. If we learn that God's will is to reconcile his people, we have not learned the lesson until we pray for love and unity in the church. So Bible reading and prayer always go together. The word learn must become our prayer. Now the next phrase, I kneel, may not grab your attention, but it is notable for Paul to say that because the usual way a Jew prayed was to stand like what you would see the Jew doing today in front of the wailing wall in Jerusalem. Kneeling was 
unusual. It was a sign of exceptional degree of earnestness as when Jesus fell on his face uh, when he prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane and Stephen faced the ordeal of martyrdom. So Paul's kneeling to pray shows that this prayer is with unusual emotion. There are two apparent reasons why he is so motivated in his prayer. Now first, as we have already seen, it is because of the stunning, amazing ministry of reconciliation he has been entrusted. It is for this reason Paul kneels. Paul is so awed by this remarkable vision of unity of that new humanity that he kneels down to pray. Now, the second reason why Paul is motivated to pray is because he is kneeling before his loving Father who gives birth to the new humanity. God is the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So he played on the words to express his idea, Father. Uh, father is the Greek word pater, and family is the word patria. Paul is not talking about every individual family. He is talking about the one whole family, the church, including those who have gone to heaven and those who remain on earth. If Paul is amazed by the creation of the new humanity, he is suddenly awed in the presence of the Father who created it. So, when you come to pray for the church, see yourself as part of an intimate family with one Father in heaven. It is amazing to be able to pray to the cosmic Father of this cosmic family. So, Paul is motivated to pray because he's awed by God's reconciliation work of bringing everyone into his family and by his access to this loving father who fathers the whole family. Now, the second thing about Paul's praying is that is the content in his praying to know God's love. Paul's purpose in his prayer is clear. He wants the believers to be strengthened by the Spirit power so that they may know intimately Christ's presence and love and to know it to the measure of the fullness of God. This is what the church that caters to different races, different classes and cultures need to experience. There are, uh, there are three parts to Paul's content of prayer here. But the first part, or the first thing, is that Paul prays for, for is that believer be strengthened with power. I want us to look at the two phrases, your inner being and your heart. That's where our new life in Christ resides in our inner being or in a heart. The way to live this new life is by faith. Just as we take care of the physical life uh, to keep it healthy and strong, so we must also take care of the spiritual life. Then our new life will be strong and fruitful. Now, Paul prays to strengthen you with power according to his glorious riches through his spirit in your inner being. But how? How do we go about to be strengthened in our inner being? 
Well, the scripture suggests three things we need to do. First, we must immerse ourselves to know God's word. There is no other way to live the Christian life but to know God's will. Second, we must exercise faith and act in obedience to God's will. Just knowing the word up here will not do anything unless we act on it. Third, we must ask for the feeling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We want to make more room for Him to be in control of our life. Now, this strengthening in your inner being by the Spirit is the same way of saying that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. To have Christ dwelling in us is the same thing as to have the Spirit dwelling in us. In fact, it is precisely by the Spirit that Christ dwells in our hearts. We have already died to ourselves and our lives are in Christ, immersing in God's Word, exercising our faith and being filled with the Spirit help us to experience our life in Christ or Christ living in us. Now, it is interesting that there are two Greek words for dwelling. The first word refers to a temporary guest who comes to dwell for a night or two and then he goes on his way. The second word refers to a resident who dwells permanently. And the second word is used here. Christ dwells in our heart permanently. The permanent resident is the master of the house. And he enters not just to cheer and to soothe, but to rule the house. So is Christ, the Lord at home, dwelling in your life? Perhaps no one has put it better than Robert Munger. In his little booklet, My Heart, Christ's Home, he tells of how after Christ entered his heart in the joy of a newfound relationship, he said, Lord, I want this heart of mine to be yours. I want to have you settle down here and be perfectly at home. Everything I have belongs to you. Let me show you around and introduce you to the various features of the home so that you may be more comfortable and we may have a fuller fellowship together. So, he proceeded to take Christ into the study, which represents what the mind focuses on. The Lord had some cleanup to do there. They went on to the living room where they agreed to meet each morning to start the day together. That went well until Munger got busy and started skipping those times. He had viewed those quiet times only as a means for his own spiritual progress rather than as a time to fellowship with the Lord. They moved on to all the other rooms of the house remodeling and cleaning wherever necessary. The final room was a hall closet that Munger had kept locked. It was there he kept those secrets that he had tried to keep hidden from the Lord. He finally had to give the Lord the key so that he could clean out that closet. That's how God works in a heart. He wants to move from room to room until every area of our lives is suitable for his dwelling place. He does this as we trust him and obey him. The first thing 
Paul prays for the believers is that they be strengthened in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in their hearts. Now, you can be strengthened to bear witness, to endure suffering, to live patiently, etc., etc. But if Paul were to be asked as to what purpose he prays for the believers to be strengthened in the inner man here in this passage, he would probably say that he wants them to be strengthened to love. In the new and reconciled humanity which Christ is creating, love is the most important virtue. The new humanity is God's family who ought to love their father and their brothers and sisters. They need the power of the Spirit's strength to enable them to love each other, especially across deep racial and cultural divide. Paul is earnest in wanting to see love characterizes the new humanity that he uses two metaphors to emphasize the importance of its depth. The believers are to be rooted and established or grounded in love. In other words, Paul likens them to a well-rooted tree and to a well-built house. Love is to be the soil in which their life is rooted, and love is to be the foundation on which their life is built. When that happens, there will be a stability of unity. But this is not all that Paul envisions for them. With their love for each other rooted and grounded firmly, Paul wants them to progress to a deeper understanding of Christ's love for them, for them to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. Now, we can debate as to what Paul means by the width, length, height, and depth. But I think uh, what Paul means by width and uh, by that is something had to do with the scope and the immensity of the love of Christ. Stott suggests it is wide enough to encompass all mankind regardless of race, culture, or class. It is long enough to last for eternity. It is deep enough to reach to the, to the most degraded sinner and high enough to exalt him to heaven. This is the love of Christ that Paul wants the church to grasp. Having established the love of Christ uh, within the church, the church is to grasp the infinite uh, love of Christ. And this indeed is overwhelming. But this is what it means to know Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge. Christ's love is too wide, too long, too deep, and too high for us to comprehend. Now we come to understand Christ's love not by individual self, by ourselves, but together with all the same Jew and Gentile, men and women, slaves and free. This is not something that is limited to an esoteric, spiritual, elite group of people. Rather, Christ's love permeates all the same, so that with them we experience the love of Christ, and then love one another and all the people whom Christ loves. But what does this mean practically for us to love our own members in CGMC? If we know the love of Christ, how do we express this love for the children and youth? 
How do you express this love to the elderly? What? Well, too old or too sick to move around? How do we express this love to those who are absent or even straying away? How do we love our own people? How do we together as a church or as a cell group grasp all the dimensions of the love of Christ? Especially during this pandemic, how do we love all those affected in our community? If we grasp the love of Christ, what would that mean for us? Some of our members have initiated to reach out to our local poor as well as the diaspora community. What we need is not just giving them food, but engaging and befriending them knowing and helping them in more relevant ways. So I'm asking whether you and your CG members may be interested to visit these people, get to know them and to take them, uh, I mean to take it from here, uh, from, from here onwards. Would you be one of them? Please share about this in your cell group. Now, the third and the ultimate goal of knowing Christ and His love is that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Can you see the progression? The Spirit strengthens us. We grasp Christ's love and God's fullness fills us. The Christian life is one of continuous growth to know God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. There you are. Once again, we meet the Trinity in their work of salvation in us. The fullness of God means the fullness of His presence and power, His life and rule. God wants us to be fully like him as children of god we should pray and aspire for nothing less than to know the fullness of god this aspiration is the same in principle as the command to be holy as god is holy and to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect to become fully like god will only happen in the new heaven when Christ returns. For this reason, many Chris Christians dismiss the need to try to be perfect. Ah, there is no way I can attain such perfection and then forgets it. But if we, we have no liberty to avoid putting it into practice now because God expects us to grow daily towards that final fullness. In fact, the Holy Spirit is given to us for this very reason, to transform us into Christ's image from one degree of glory to another. The bottom line is this. Our calling is to be perfect and the resources are given us to become perfect, even though we won't be able to attain perfection in this life. As we look back at this prayer, we find we cannot but be struck by Paul's audacious request. He prays that the believers may be strengthened by the power of the Spirit and the indwelling presence of Christ the rooting and grounding of their lives in love, the knowledge of Christ's love in all its dimensions, and the fullness of God himself. It amazes me that Paul is daringly bold to pray such a prayer. And he is going to be even more audacious because he believes that God can do it. 
Now we come to the third part of our sermon, and that is Paul's confidence in praying about God's unlimited power. Paul forcefully states that God can grant these bold requests because he's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to the power that's at work within us. Stott again breaks his sentence into seven sequential phrases. One, our God is able to do or to work for he is alive and active, actively working. Two, our God is able to do all we ask, for he hears us and answers us. Three, our God is able to do what we imagine, for he knows our thoughts and even our dreams, which we dare not ask for. Four, our God is able to do all that we ask or imagine, for he knows it all and is all powerful to carry it out. Five, our God is able to do more than all that we ask or imagine, for his expectations are higher than ours. Six, our God is able to do what we ask or imagine immeasurably more, for he gives his grace lavishly. And seven, our God is able to do immeasurably more than, for he is a super abundant God. Our God grants these bold requests according to his power that is at work within us, both individually as well as the church. It is the power of the resurrection, the power which raised Christ from the dead and throned him in the heavenlies and then raised and enthroned us there with him. That is the power which is at work within the Christian and the church. Paul is convinced that divine power can generate divine love in that divine society, which is the church. Old said, the only appropriate thing left is to sing the doxology. To him be the glory. Paul sings it to God, the God of the resurrection power, who alone can make the prayer come true. And you and I in the church should do nothing less than that. When we gather together, we should raise our voices to praise our glorious God. The power comes from Him, and so the glory must go back to Him. We must praise God for His astounding work. The glory is to be sounded in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. That is, in the body and in the head, the church is the place where God is given the honor and glory, and it is going to be an eternity of glorifying God. It is one age overlapping with another, and then another to the remotest infinity. It is literally unto all the generation of the age of the ages. Amen. <laughs> Let me draw this to a conclusion. Paul's audacity in praying should take away our breath. We learn from him three aspects of prayer if we are to pray meaningfully. First, the motivation of his prayer we must pray for our ministry and the people we minister to. It is an intimate circle of brothers and sisters we pray for. And we have access to the father of this family. Second, the content of this prayer, his prayer uh, is that we pray for the inner life of our brothers and sisters where it matters most to God. 
We pray for the inner life to be strengthened with power to grasp the love of Christ so that it will grow to be filled with the fullness of God. And third, the confidence of his prayer. We pray with expectation because of the incomparable power of God will accomplish what we ask for. Paul allow us this privilege into his inner chambers behind parted curtains into the holiest place where he kneels down to pray. We hear his passionate praying for the believers to know Christ's love and to become all the, like God. We notice the language and the superlatives he employed to express his heightened emotion. Above all, he's caught up with the worship of God in the midst of writing to God. Be the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, even as we hear your word, our hearts are lifted up to you. You are glorious. You are powerful. You are to be honored. And all glory goes to you. We thank you that you are more than able to do all that we ask or imagine. We thank you that you are such a God that we can come to you in confidence to pray to you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you are also generous to answer those prayers that we may come to know you and to know Christ and his love and to know you to the very full, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you draw us in the intimate circle to come to bow before you and to pray. Father God, I pray that we all catch this vision of coming to you to intercede, to pray, that Lord, we may become a praying church. All of us become a praying Christian. Lord, help us to have this in our heart so that we desire to come to you, Lord. Hear this our prayer. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.
And now let's all rise to receive this benediction. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.